Hi, I'm Jeff Russo, and I write music for lots of different things. Television, film, video games, um, many different things. I think today we're going to look at stuff that I'm doing for Star Trek. It's interesting. So originally, you know, we were talking about how a lot of times you need original material that doesn't really exist anywhere. So I, I had some sound ideas in my head that I thought would sound very cool. And when I first started writing and I first went to start writing this, I didn't really have this, these things available to me. They were only in my head. So how was I going to create that? So I started with some pads and stuff that I could find, that I could manipulate into, into what I thought I was thinking of. But in the end, I realized what I really needed to do was I really needed to get in the studio with an orchestra and make some, some custom sounds. One of the things I thought about when, when wanting to um, start this first cue for this episode of, of Discovery was that it needed to be something very unique for the show because it was going to be the very first thing that anybody had heard from Star Trek in a decade. Especially because we were opening, you know, close up on the eye of a Klingon, which you don't know until we pull back and you see that it's the face of this Klingon. So I thought it was sort of important. So having something that was just the sound of our show start the entire thing out was really important to me. I thought, I don't have any of that material. I don't really have um, anything that is specific. Like, I, there's many sample libraries. There's all this stuff that has stuff that is out there, and it sounds really cool and is really interesting, but I needed to, um, I needed to create, I think, some sounds just for Trek. So I went into the, I went into the studio with a smaller orchestra and started making some, some sounds. And, and one of those things was sort of inspired by the sound of Trek and this sort of very sort of uh, uniquely airy string sounds. And a lot of that um, may have been also inspired by some of the, the, sp the Spitfire stuff in Tundra. Uh, there's this one patch, it's, it's called Ricochet that I, I play a lot. That's so cool. That that is the that's such a, a an interesting sound and such an interesting um, thing for uh, and evocative. I should say it's very evocative. Um, but a lot of times it's it's played in a in a minor key. And if it's minor and I need to write something in major, um, I can't really use that. So I needed to figure out how to do something that was kind of in the same world. I ended up. Um, reorchestrating that kind of a thing and ended up with something like this. Um. So to me that had obviously a bit more of the Star Trek sound. There was a, there's a pad in there and there is, you know, some high trems and some high flutes and all mixed together in this one instrument that I created. That was sort of the, the jumping off point for this particular, this particular cue, which starts out by playing this part. So 
So one of the things we talked about um, when I when I first spotted the the show with the producers was to start it out feeling whimsical and wondrous, and then to turn to a darker um, feeling once we realize what we're looking at, which is this face of a Klingon who is basically saying we want to take over the universe. <laughs> That's how that. That's how that all all really started out. Was with sort of one idea, one sort of sound, and one vision of what the sound of the beginning could be. And then I sort of had to work out from there. It was really a question of what was I going to use to 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 melodically um, embody the Klingons um, in this particular cue. And I sort of went back and forth with different solo instruments. Um, woodwinds and, and stuff and I, I, I landed I landed on Duke and that really that really made it sort of happen and the idea was like there are no real Duke samples that sound solo Duke samples that sound very convincing like you can get there you know there there are a couple of um, there are a couple of, uh, of ones this one this one in particular. That sample sounds pretty good, but Chris Bleth, who is the local sort of ethnic flute guru, I, I should say, he he came in and played something that was just unbelievable. And I, I had written I had written this, and you can you can hear what um you can hear what I had written by. That was the next line to be written before I really started to write the rest of the cue. Um, that was that was the next piece of the puzzle for me, and I sort of wrote it knowing that it was going to get a little more affected. It was going to get a little more. Um, There's going to be some more flourishes. Like I can play the finished one, um, which then you can hear the difference. So. sort of hear it, you can sort of hear the difference here. You know, there's a little more, there's a little more um, person in it, you know, and it's, it's difficult to put the person in it when you're, when you're dealing with samples. And sometimes you're stuck with dealing with samples and you do the best that you can. And it sounded fine to me. And then Chris started playing and I was like, oh, okay, that's, this is really great. Um, but so the, the next thing um, on top of that uh, was gonna be all of the sort of more percussion and um, more sound design -y aspect of this beginning part. So as I, as I started building this cue, it started with this and then added the deduke. And then the next thing was going to be um, a lot of percussion stuff. So I use a lot of the Hans Zimmer um, percussion library, uh, the Spitfire percussion library, and the Spitfire percussion for Timps. Um, so what ended up, where we ended up going with that stuff. So this is great. These are the Surdus from uh, from the Hans Zimmer library, which are great, and the low hits from the Hans Zimmer library, which are really great. And then one of the other things I did was timps, and, and, and I started I started building a lot. Um, I, start, I start building a lot with percussion. I started out as a drummer, so I, I, I sort of always build cues and pieces of music from a from a rhythmic standpoint rather than a, um, a strictly melodic standpoint. I I have melodic ideas that I want to try to get down before I start building a, a rhythm template for for a cue, but then I'll sort of put the melody aside and start thinking what 
the rhythmic structure of the cue is going to be. Once I do that, I'll go back and then rework the, the, the melody to work with the, with the percussion. So what I did with this was I started working on the percussion aspect of it to see like how it was going to build. Now, one of the other things I did, the same way I built some orchestral uh, instruments, I also built a bunch of percussion instruments. So I had me and three other percussionists go into a studio and we just put out all of these big drums and we started playing a bunch of patterns that I had pre-written out for us. And then I created these loops. One of the loops um, we I, I did was, was, so this is just a loop that the three of us were playing. It just kept playing. And I, then I'm able to quickly build uh, percussion things, right? So I can build this percussion thing. I'll build percussion. I'll build percussion loops. And I use a lot of, I, I tend to use a lot of filters on percussion to sort of make the percussion a little more evocative. I'll, I'll build a filter, I'll build a filter pass into it to build tension as we get, as the filter opens and opens and opens and opens until it's finally wide open and then you'll see the whole, the whole piece opens up. Um, I tend to do that a lot with, with percussion in, in Star Trek and, and maybe everything, maybe that's a, something I do all the time and maybe I shouldn't do that as much anymore. Um, and, and that was sort of the next, that was sort of the next stop on the uh, on this particular cue was sort of trying to build what the percussion was going to end up being like which then ended up being like this so i would I would build percussion parts that I'm playing around the loop to make it sound a little more live. And that, then I started building all of the other parts around it. So one of the other things I needed to do was then start building what the sound design aspect of the whole thing was. Um, and a lot of that sound design comes from these things that I would just create from various synthesizers, um, various patches in various different places and just sort of really mess, really mess, really mess with things um, until they were feeling, they were feeling like really what I wanted it to, to feel like. You know, a lot of times I'll sit here and just, you know, turn knobs and all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, that sounds cool. You know, and a lot of this time is spent before I actually sit down and write cues because there, when you're chasing an episode of television, there's not a lot of time to twist knobs and, and try and figure out what things sound like. You just don't have that kind of time. I've got to turn around an episode of Star Trek in five days to turn around an entire episode to the orchestrator so we can go and record the episode with the with the orchestra. So there's not a lot of time to do that. So I had to do a lot of pre-work on the show. And I've done the same with season two, which is I spent about a month coming up with new sounds and new things that were going to hopefully be used at some point during the new season. Um, you know, the orchestra plays all the strings. I do strings, winds, and brass with the orchestra. Um, and everything else, percussion was recorded and then looped and used, utilized in a way that would make it easier for me to do because recording percussion with the orchestra makes orchestra recordings a lot more difficult because it's a lot more trying to fix things. Um, and from a mix perspective, it's, it's also, it becomes very cumbersome. And we don't have a lot of time to mix, you know, a 65 piece orchestra. So we try to, in, in order to make it work, I created all these loopable, patches that I could use to build on top of. But I would say it's about 70% orchestra, 30% not orchestra. You know, I, I use um, some orchestral non-live material like harp I don't record, so I use a Spitfire harp. That sounds totally believable. It sounds totally great. And, it sound, and I usually affect it and put delays on it and make it 
sound kind of cool. Um, not that it doesn't already sound kind of cool, but to make it sound sort of more interesting and different than just a straight up just person with a harp in his hand or her hand. And I'd, yeah, I'd say about 30% is sort of like made sounds and or other libraries. Like I, I tend to use the low, the low tundra and the high tundra stuff layered into everything that, that I do. You know, that there's that one low tundra patch, which is in this queue as well. The, uh, the no rosin patch, which literally you can't get that, you can't get that sound unless you do what you guys did, which was record an enormous orchestra playing at triple P, you know, just as quiet as possible. And that sound is basically ungettable, you know? It's just unbelievable, you know? You can't really get that sound with 36 string players, which is what I normally have. Um, so I tend to use that a lot. That was the next thing that I, that I ended up putting into this cue, as a matter of fact, now that we're talking about that. So once we're here, I end up adding the low tundra strings. The, the low tundra strings really fills in a lot of the bottom of the um, of the cue in a way that I couldn't do with with just a, a 36 piece string 36 strings because there's you know I don't know 100 string players or whatever playing that and uh, so I, I tend to layer that into everything um, I also tend to use just the straight up string ensemble patch and also will end up layering that as well because there's something that's very There's something very evocative about those string pushes that is are, are hard to get with um, with just, you know, again, 36 string players. That it's great to get them to play those high lines, you know, um, but really wanting to fill out the bottom. Uh, a lot of layering of, of, of strings in samples really helps, really helps. And then here you can hear what that sounds like too. Let's see if that worked. string pushes really do make it make it very meaningfully evocative and dark. I started adding some other uh, other string parts like this big low bass um, started playing along with the, with the low string ensembles. Now that I have sort of some some bass for the whole the whole cue, I start thinking about this next melodic part, um, and a lot of that came from I think it was this line. So a lot of it came from, and I'll, I I really had the idea to do it in horns, which was. So that was the idea from a melodic standpoint, and I built that in the horn part.
so the, the real question at that point was, how do I build all that into the entire thing? And then there, there was me wanting to build all of this more rhythmic stuff, which I tend to do with, um, with strings. And I built that like... <laughs> So how does that all work? I ended up just just experimenting with what with what amount of horns versus what amount of strings can really work. Um, and then how does all that work with all of the percussion stuff? And in the end, it all sort of came together. In the end, it all sort of came together to be more like this. The, the idea was to make it sort of, you don't really know what's happening until this reveal where we see the Klingons for the first time. Has this big line, we come in peace, and that was really how that whole thing gets built. You know, from the from the beginning to the end, I try to take it sort of piece by piece, always thinking about what the melody is going to do from from the beginning of the cue to the end of the cue. And you know, it's really about keeping that being the most important part, but then turning that off, building the other part of it, and then seeing how they work together. And if they don't work, then I start stripping stuff away, and sort of it's 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 really like kind of experimenting the whole way through. That's how I end up writing cues like this. You know, it's it's kind of like just feeling my way around in the dark <laughs> until I until something comes out. You know, I, I spent I spent a lot more time on writing this cue. Like a minute and a half long cue now that has this much orchestration, I if I if I spend more than three hours on it, it's too much because I don't have time to do the rest of it. I, have, I need time to do the rest of it. So it's about two and a half to three hours to do something like this. This one I took about a day and a half to write because it was the first cue that anybody was ever gonna see and I wanted to, so I wrote and then I redid and then I went back and I was like, maybe that melody's not as good as I would like it to be. Da, 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 da. Hmm, okay, let me see what else I can do there. Um, so I took a little longer, but normally it would be like three hours. When you, when you think of Jerry Goldsmith and you think of, of um, James Horner and Alexander Courage and all, all of these unbelievable composers. <laughs> I, I think, I don't know how I stand next to those guys and not feel like I have absolutely no idea what the hell I'm doing. And then I sort of have to just put that aside and write a melody and, and write a thing and, and see, see, what, see what happens. So there's that moment where it's just, it's absolutely terrifying. There's absolute terror. Sitting down to write the first cue, and this was it. This was the one. Um, this was the first cue that I wrote for the show. Uh, other than the main title, which I had already written. I had, I had started by writing the main title before I ever saw what the whole episode was going to be like. And they asked me to do that because they, they had put together this promo, and they were like, you know, maybe you could start sketching a main title and, it, and what ended up happening was I, I had this idea melodically and I had this other idea of how to sort of take what was the original theme and sort of bookend it at the end of the um, at the end of the, the piece and they were very into that they were very much into into that idea like how to sort of tie the old into the new which I, I thought that was the the original idea was how how do we make this something that is very Trek and yet still have a modern take on on modern film scores and modern television scores. So um, it was it was 
all very daunting. It was all extremely daunting, like just sitting there looking at Star Trek. It says Star Trek. And I go, oh man, I can't, it, it's hard, it's hard to, it was hard to imagine. And, and not to mention I was a huge Star Trek fan growing up. So it was one of those, it was one of those like, if I could go back and, and tell my, my 12 or 13 year old self what I'd be doing 30 years later, um, I would say, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would say. I'd say, come on, are you kidding? You know, Jerry Goldsmith was a genius at writing for for brass, which is why he basically created the Star Trek sound. Like once Alexander Courage obviously wrote that, um, you know, wrote the wrote the incredible, and I'm, I just have to do it right now because it's so incredible. <laughs> Jerry Goldsmith was a genius at that. Do I have any advice? I always sort of look to the masters um, and and see what they would do. You know, how how do they do it harmonically? Because it's very easy for, for brass to muddy stuff up. Very easy. If you put too much in the brass and not enough in the strings or vice versa, you know, balance in orchestration is 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 really important. I think that the most important thing is when you have a melody that needs to be played, make sure that that's being supported. Um, you don't need a lot of stuff to, to support that. So if there's a lot of brass playing it, maybe don't play a lot in the woodwinds or don't play a lot in the strings and sort of try to thin stuff out because brass takes up so much room. You know, it's, I think it's also more difficult to do in this kind of context because we as composers end up writing to the ability of the sample libraries, right? It's, it's very easy to be like, okay, so I have this thing. You know, uh, but that's one articulation and there's like a thousand different ones and they're not, all, they're not all available at all times. So, you know, are we always thinking about, okay, I'm doing it this way, but I'm gonna need to make a note to the orchestrator like, no, these, these notes need to be tied and this note needs to be slurred because you don't do that. Like when you're, when an orchestrator is looking at your MIDI, they don't see like these notes are supposed to be tied or this note is supposed to be slurred or this isn't played, this played as a dotted eighth note and this played as a 16th note and they, it doesn't always appear that way. So that can make it more difficult. Uh, I'm not the greatest programmer, so I tend to go very fast and then have a phone call with my orchestrator to say, okay, here, this is this, this is that, this is that, or I'll make notes inside the session, like, you know, I'll open up the, um, I'll open up the comments and I'll make, you know, okay, so at measure 13, this is a tied note to this, or this is supposed to be played as dotted eighth notes, or this entire section should tie every third note, which you just can't do. And then, in the end, the mock-ups don't sound exactly the same as what, what we end up recording because if I were to try to make the mock-up sound like that, I would spend two days programming and I don't have time to do the programming for something like this. You know, on a film, I have a lot more time, so I, I spend a little more time trying to program. I would say if anybody else has any um, true advice on how to write for horns, they could call me and give me that advice <laughs> because I think we all, we, all could, we all could use a little of it. Um, but I, I think, you know, listening to some of the masters and just seeing how they tend to write for horns is really important. And, and brass is a big part of the Star Trek sound. So I've had to do a lot of listening and a lot of um, trying to figure out what the horn should do. You know, a lot of triplet shorts with, with the... Um, with the trumpets and a, and, a, and a lot of, you know, melodies played on French horns, which is also is very heroic sounding. And when I do that, don't do that on strings. Don't do them at the same time because they tend to get muddied up. And I, I started there and then I realized, okay, this is muddying this up. Let's let's have the strings play all the rhythm. And then have the, have the, um, the horns play the melody. The process with something like this, for instance, so I've built this cue, it ends up sounding 80% of the way there in my in my ears like you know I could probably make it sound a little better but then what I do is it gets pr this session gets prepped I print it and send it to the producers for um, for notes and they hear this version of it Alex Kurtzman who is the producer main producer on, on this show 
he listens with an ear knowing where it's going to end up. He has a lot of experience with, you know, mock-ups versus orchestra and what happens to a piece once you once you go to the orchestra. Um, so he listens with with that in mind. Um, his notes are, can it be a little bigger here? Can we get it to be a little more melodic here? We need it to warm up here. It needs to be more emotional here. Or, you know, I'm, this, this really needs, we're not hitting this moment enough. Can we hit this moment more? He has very, um, very broad um, creative notes. He, he is less, I think, less interested in the minutia and more interested in, in the general feel of what what we're doing am i getting the point across there have been times when he's like this is not really hitting it for me what can we do and i go i will send you another cue <laughs> you know other than that it goes to him he makes those notes it comes back we make the adjustments go to the and then i send these um these mock-ups these sequences to the org to my orchestrator her name is amy she's amazing and she takes all this midi and notes and whatever and then puts it all on paper and then we go and record it with the orchestra. And, you know, there's a lot of prep time involved because it is somewhat of a hybrid score, 70% orchestra, 30% electronic, especially in terms of the percussion. Um, and we do a lot of short strings. So we normally, when we record the orchestra, split it all up. We record the strings and the winds in the morning, and we record the brass in the afternoon. Um, that way, I have mix control, and if anything needs to be edited and fixed, like a lot of times, you know, short strings are about 20 sec 20 milliseconds late compared to the prelays so that'll have to be fixed in in the mix process um, so we we tended to like to split everything up and not record everything at the same time because we have a lot more control over things we work in a cerebral environment like all we do all day is think and use our brains it's not my it can't be mindless because you have to have an idea as to where something is going and where something has been and you have so many things you have to keep in mind and that's just the music writing that's not even any of the managerial or administrative stuff that you have to deal with in terms of, of making um, a score and, and getting it from the starting line to the finish line having having moments to to clear your mind is really important or else it'll all just be mush there have been days when i'm like oh it's just mush scrap it and then go for a walk and come back and try to and try to write something else but it's that's a difficult i think that's one of the more difficult parts i think of our job in general is that we we tend to um work alone you know and i come from being in a band so this this working alone in a room is relatively new to me you know and it's only in the last nine nine years or so that i've been doing this uh eight years or so and um before that, I was just in a band playing music with three other guys, and we were we would bounce ideas off of each other, and like always, something was going on creatively, um, and there's something very meaningful to that. So it's it's a completely different thing, which is why I like to have a team. You know, I have I work with an engineer, I work I have an assistant, and um, I, I work with an orchestrator and and other and other people who who are a part of the creative process because. You know, without that, you end up writing something in a bubble. And sometimes it's good, but sometimes you have no basis for any sort of comparison. I, I need to be able to bounce ideas off of something for it to come back and go, oh. You know, I, I'll have my engineer sit and listen to something, and he may agree, disagree, like it or not like it, but whatever it is, his response might elicit a new response in me. And that's the thing that I, I, I long for is in, instead of sitting in a room by myself in the dark, which I do a lot. Um, it's, it, it's difficult. So getting out and talking to people and, and getting people to, to uh, give you feedback, I think, is a really important part of what we do.